use of domestic imagery in art. For the first time since the advent of modernism, visitors to Woman House saw knitting, crocheting, and quilting, what one critic called the soft, the sewn, and the stitched. These were combined with messages about the real lives that girls and women were living. Part art showcase and part political statement, Women House opened the door for a higher consciousness about institutional exclusions in the art world. In short, this group of teachers and their students launched a movement that rippled through the 70s and into the 80s with the emergence of new feminist publications, exhibition spaces, and organizations like the Women's Caucus for the Arts. Miriam Shapiro, launched the pattern and decoration movement that included both men and women, by the way. Oops. And Judy Chicago um, created the dinner party in collaboration with over 400 uh, women, and craft, uh, with women artists and, and craftspersons celebrating women's, uh, uh, women artists from history Artemisia Gentileschi to George O'Keefe. Louise Bourgeois, who had been working in New York since the 30s, surfaced with drawings that directly reflected, oops, that directly reflected images of house and home. Paintings that she actually hidden away for years According to Bourgeois, she'd suppressed these works created in the 1940s because, in her words, I knew I'd be ridiculed. Back then, no one wanted to look, like, look at stuff like that. Throughout the 70s, a heightened multicultural awareness and attention to both sexism and racism empowered activists like Faith Ringgold, who began making dolls. She did actually become an, managed to become an artist after 20 years of teaching. Uh, began making dolls and quilts that were uh, simultaneously political statements and beautiful domestic references. Ringgold and other African-American artists confronted the absence of black women in the art world and supported each other in making objects re that reflected their African-American roots. The leading feminist art critic and advocate for women artists, Lucy Lepard, in a recent publication has lamented the fact that while feminist artists of the 70s were rediscovering their mothers and grandmothers' strategies, for survival through beauty, marveling at quilts, china painting, hooked rugs, embroidery, and other homemade treasures. They should have also been discovering women who made paintings, sculptures, and yard shows in a vernacular context. But at that time, self-taught artists like Nellie Mae Rowe were overlooked by most of their contemporaries in mainstream art. Imagine what first-generation feminist artists might have learned from women like Nellie Mae Rowe, or Clementine Hunter, or Bessie Harvey, Sister Gertrude Morgan, or Gaylene Aiken. It wasn't until the Black Folk Art Show at the Corcoran in 1982 in which Nellie Mae Rowe was one of only three fem female artists among the 20 represented, that her work began to receive national exposure. It opened just a few months before her death, but by then the discovery of a rich vocabulary related to house and home, something the 70s feminists had fought so hard to bring about, had already been underway for 30 years at 241 Paces Ferry Road. She actually received some recognition from the Gorilla Girls um, in uh, 1985 with this uh, poster. 
In her work on self-taught artists, the scholar Judith McWillie has pointed out has pointed out how the important 20th century synthesis of African art and European traditions heralded by shows like Primitivism in the 20, 20th century at the Museum of Modern Art in 1985 and typically credited in a movement typically credited to Picasso and Matisse for their discovery of Africa. In fact, McWillie, urges, uh, uh, McWillie argues this innovation had already been accomplished by untrained African American artists in the South as they combined elements from an African past with unique American styles. I would argue in a similar way that Nellie Mae Rowe's Playhouse and drawings also prefigured a revolution in art the representation of women's lives using the materials and processes of everyday life. There will not be another Nellie Mae Rowe, so we can only hope that with greater visibility for self-taught artists, the importance of their work will become better known. Also that the barriers between mainstream art and self-taught artists will continue to dissolve. I would love to see more museum shows with mainstream artists and self-taught artists side by side, accompanied, mind you, of course, by scholarship that recognizes and respects the deep significance of each artist's origins and context, scholarship that, and exhibitions that will give women artists, like Nellie Mae Rowe, their rightful place in American art. Thank you. Now we'd like to, um, Joyce would like to answer some questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or Would ask you? some. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Um, and we can probably hear, <coughs> oh wait, Kevin, <coughs> do you need, um, are you, you going to tape the questions you need them asked into the microphone? Okay. Um, if you will, you will proceed, I'll. Sure okay, I, I'd love to um, <clears throat> to try to answer any questions that you might have or hear any comments that you have. I really, um, as I said, I feel like I'm um, coming into Nellie Mae Rose's hometown, and um, I'd love to learn more about her. And this is the, the beginning of a process for me. The slides, um, those are the ones that you chose for your uh, presentation here? I, yeah. I, I, yes. wasn't, I just wasn't too clear about that, the particular ones. Mm -hmm. I tried to, um, you mean of the drawings? Yes, yes. Mm. I tried to find, uh, show examples that covered the territory of how she represented the house in the drawings, how she represented herself in relationship to the house, and how she represented herself in relationship to the garden. So these are all the ones there, that exist of these subjects? Yes, this is, this, I had 40 min, 45 minutes, so I, that was. <laughs> you did not see them. No, uh, but there are many. There are many other examples uh, of, on all of these themes, and some that you may well be familiar with. Can you talk about how you found Nellie Mae Rowe and your first impressions of her, please? Well, um, as Susan mentioned in her introduction, I, um, I'm personally interested in um, self-taught artists and particularly the women. Um, I'm, I have been for some years uh, and I've, I've known about her work 
for a while. I've been to presentations where I think some that Susan has given that um, I've seen her work actually a few years ago here and in other, in other collections. Um, I'm on the board of a foundation for American self-taught artists. I hope you'll go to the website and look at it and um, you'll find Nellie May Rowe there. And um, we're, this is a foundation that I'm an advisor um, to them. It's a foundation that is um, trying to archive film footage on self-taught artists to collect some of this fragile material that isn't going to last very long. Excuse me, and we've also made our first film, a 53-minute film on James Castle, the um, self-taught artist from Boise, Idaho. So in the process of gathering material for the Foundation for American Self-Taught Artists, um, I did see, uh, I did read about um, Nellie's Playhouse. And so I, um, Susan was kind enough to uh, let me see the film and um, that kind of sparked the, this, the idea of this theme, which in, I hope it came through in such a short time, but it so richly connects with the history of art um, that uh, it really made me um, feel more convinced that these artists' work should be better known and should be shown within the context. I mean, it's amazing, really, that she was doing the kind of work she was doing while in another part of the art world, people were fighting for permission to be able to do that kind of work. Not precisely her kind of work, but real work that was about their lives and that used the materials and um, crafts that she was interested in. I should have been wearing my running shoes. During her lifetime, uh, what kind of income did Ms. Rowe realize from her artwork? I'm sorry, I, I didn't... During her lifetime, what kind of money or income did she realize from her work? Oh, I'm sure there are people here that can answer that better than I. Maybe Susan. Um. Um, if any of, the, any of the family members would like to address that, Can you, you want to talk about it, Kat? She wasn't recognized nationally until 1975, and she was 75 years old, so it wasn't that much of her life that she was recognized as an artist. During her lifetime, I'll just say, I think the income might have eluded her during her lifetime, and I'll just leave it at that. Yes, I think I think that I would assume that that's the case, and also um, I hope it comes through that I think the, the, part of the art that she needs to be recognized for is not really saleable art. Um, it's e e ephemeral and it's gone. It was that amazing yard and those little things that sometimes fell apart after um, a couple months. Um, but, and not just the individual objects, but the enterprise that she was engaged in, which is really quite phenomenal. I'd, I'd like to ask the family and other people who visited her um, what you saw of her process of adjusting things, adding things, changing things. Um. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself too? Because um, it's wonderful that there are family members here. And Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Ken Brown. Um, my cousin Kathy, Bob, my aunt who was, you know, she was our great aunt, but her aunt, uh, but we all knew her my sister Darlene, and uh, you know, to, 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 to grow up with Aunt Nellie, you know, you just, 
you just you just